Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of History of Science and Technology Q&A. So I'm happy to try and answer whatever questions I can about either history that I've personally been involved in or more ancient history that I might know something about, about uh, areas of science that I know about and areas of technology that I might know about. And I see we have a number of questions that uh, were left over from last time. There was one question about uh, Stan Ulam and cellular automata. And there's a movie that just recently came out that has the same title as uh, autobiography that Stan Ulam wrote called Adventures of a Mathematician. And I did my homework and I watched the movie. Um, and uh, I don't know, everybody has different preferences in movies. Um, I, I, I thought um, this one I, I found, let's say I found it interesting. Um, I, it was um, uh, um, in terms of pure theatrical value, there's always a trade-off. You know, some movies are accurate, some movies are uh, of high entertainment value. Uh, I would suspect this one is more on the accuracy side. Um, although it did bother me that in this movie, the, uh, the, one of the big characters in the movie was John von Neumann, and the actor who was playing John von Neumann just looked nothing like John von Neumann. And so that probably to most people, it wouldn't make any difference, but that uh, sort of bothered me. And I think um, the, uh, uh, so I, I mean, I knew Stan Ulam in the last couple of years of his life, and um, maybe I can comment a little bit on the history such as I know it, uh, both of cellular automata and of, uh, of Stan Ulam. So, you know, the idea of cellular automata that you have some grid of cells and each cell is black or white, and then you have some local rule and so on, that idea um, has arisen many times. I mean, I've been sort of waiting for somebody to unearth a piece of Babylonian, you know, a Babylonian tablet that has a cellular automaton on it. That hasn't happened. Um, I don't think it could not. I, I think it's perfectly possible that could happen. In fact, one thing I saw just recently was a, an interesting Babylonian tablet uh, that had various maze designs on it. I think it had eight different maze designs. There's one particular maze design that is really a very common maze design, which is variously said to be the plan of the um, maze of the Minotaur and Knossos on Crete you know, designed by Daedalus. It's otherwise said to be the logo of the city of Troy. It's said to be, you know, the pattern of the walls of the city of Troy. It's, it's said to be many things, but it's a particular maze pattern that is one of many possible combinatorial possibilities. And it shows up in many places. It shows up in the cathedral and Chartres. It shows up in just all sorts of places. Uh, not clear completely what its origin is. And you see it on a lot of coinage. You see it on a lot of um, uh, coinage from Crete, particularly. Um, the, this particular maze pattern. So the thing I found interesting was there's a, a tablet that was discovered fairly recently, I think, that has multiple different maze patterns on it, including, I think, the famous one. Um, but it's kind of an enumeration of possible combinatorial patterns. And that makes one feel like, you know, the Babylonians were really close to having cellular automata, but I don't think they had them. And um, uh, this whole question about this phenomenon that is a big piece of things I've studied of, you know, simple rules, complicated behavior. There's so many near misses to that idea over the course of history. But in any case, the, um, the thing that John von Neumann got interested in must have been 1946, seven, that kind of time frame. So, so the history there was that, that um, uh, John von Neumann was a originally Hungarian, uh, mathematician who um, came to the US and had a series of uh, really worked on mathematical logic. He worked on trying to give a kind of a formal description of quantum mechanics. He was sort of in very much the right place at the right time. And I think he always felt that he should have discovered Gödel's theorem, but he didn't. But as soon as he kind of heard Gödel present Gödel's theorem, he got it immediately. And I think the story of John von Neumann in many ways was a story of he was a very quick person. Everybody says he was, he was like, you know, the quickest person they, they met. And he had very broad knowledge of lots of kinds of things. Also a very, a very cheerful fellow, apparently. Um, and uh, he, um, uh, but he tended, I think, to be a little bit light on the deep thinking side. I mean, he tended to be a great problem solver and not necessarily dig all the way down to, you know, what was the fundamental point. 
And, but he was a good enough problem solver that, you know, and he managed to produce sort of elegant uh, uh, or at least, you know, good mathematical structures for his problems. So the formulation of quantum mechanics, et cetera. Then later on, he got involved with electronic computers. Um, he was um, a, um, uh, he was responsible for an important report that got written uh, for the ENIAC um, about, uh, it must've been 1946, I would guess, about sort of how to program the ENIAC and sort of how you think about uh, applying ideas from mathematics and logic to the problem of computer programming. And he really pushed the idea of procedural programming. Uh, I think Eckert and Mortley, the people who built the ENIAC were also involved in this, but um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, this idea of kind of procedural programming was, was a very, you know, it is, it is probably rightly called sort of a von Neumann style of, of programming, although that also has tended to mean the sequential processing idea. But this idea of, of, you know, there are registers, you store things in them, that was very much the design of the machine. And that was the design of what, what von Neumann kind of specified for that. And there's a little, there's a few, you know, if you read, read what he wrote, there are a few little, little um, pieces of elegant swords play about kind of more theoretical aspects of logic um, that, uh, but it's, it's mostly a, a pretty, you know, sort of what to me today looks like a rather pedestrian kind of procedural programming idea based very strongly on the actual hardware of those machines. Um, and also famously, uh, you know, he, he made some, I would say, uh, you know, some guesses which didn't turn out very good like, for example, he imagined that there, nobody would ever write a program longer than, I don't remember how many lines it was, you know, 200 lines long or something. And, and basically, why did he say that? Well, because he was thinking about mathematical theorems and people don't write theorems longer than that. But, but he hadn't thought of somehow, I think, kind of the idea of subroutines, um, which in a sense you should have been able to think of from the idea of formulas, because there are, after all, you know, I'm sorry, if theorems, because you know, one theorem uses other theorems and that allows you to have a much bigger kind of, you know, you've got these sub theorems, so to speak, just as you have sub programs. Uh, he also, I think was responsible for the claim that the US were made to IBM, I think, that the US would never have a need for more than five computers, which was again, a, a, a you know, it was, a, it was based on a sort of a, a cognitive model at the time um, that, uh, well, uh, you know, who knows, maybe in the, in the world of the future, if the pendulum swings towards cloud computing enough, maybe there'll only be, you know, maybe at some level it's like declare victory by saying there are only N, uh, you know, cloud providers in, in the US or something. But, you know, it, he did a lot of things like in 1950, he started looking at um, numerical weather forecasting, um, using computers to do weather forecasting. I don't think it was clear to him at the time how difficult or easy that would be. It was a reasonable thing to try. Um, the, uh, I, I certainly, when, I would say that one of the things, so I worked at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for a few years in the early 1980s. And at that time, there were uh, still a few people kind of left over from the days of, of when von Neumann had been there and when he had built this so-called Joniak computer that was the, um, uh, the computer that um, uh, sort of the, the, an iteration on the ENIAC that was built at the Institute for Advanced Study. And the, the, the story partially, and I think um, sort of a little bit simplified story was that when von Neumann died, the mathematicians at the Institute who'd never been very keen on this idea of a, a, you know, a nasty actual physical computery thing there had sort of just been very happy to accept the offer from, from Thomas Watson of, you know, I'll just send a truck and take it over to IBM, which was then in, in downtown uh, New York. Um, and uh, that's the, you know, get, get, take the computer out of there. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, a few years ago, when the building was being demolished, um, a friend of mine who's, a, I guess, maybe a trustee or something of the Institute now, um, had arranged to get the on-off switch of the computer that had been bolted to the wall of this building that was then being demolished. Um, uh, the, got it as kind of a collector's artifact, so to speak. But in any case, back to um, uh, von Neumann and so on. So von Neumann had been interested in, uh, sort of got interested in computers through being sort of brought in as a consultant for that, was also interested in brains and how brains work and kind of uh, was, was concerned with this question of sort of what's the, what's the kind of common thread between brains and machines. In fact, the last book that von Neumann wrote uh, 
um, which was, uh, I think, based on lectures he gave at Cornell. Um, what were they called? The something, the the machine and the brain, or something. The the uh, it was a time. It was the 1950s. It was a time when uh, the whole idea of of sort of uh, giant electronic brains was sort of coming on the scene um, in in kind of public awareness, and also where people from a, a uh, were thinking about that in a more theoretical way. I mean, one of the fundamental things to realize is nobody had any idea how hard it would be or not to make an artificial brain. I mean, it's just not obvious. People didn't know how hard it would be to do weather prediction. People didn't know, you know, some things turned out to be hard, some things turned out to be easy. Um, you know, people, uh, and, and so there was a lot of uh, energy in the, in the, by the mid-1950s in you know, the term artificial intelligence had been invented, I think, by John McCarthy. Um, and uh, there were sort of a, a gaggle of people around MIT, Claude Shannon, Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy. Uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, um, uh, Jerry Letvin. Um, these, were, these were people who were interested in the sort of artificial intelligence idea. That had been a little bit of the sort of an outgrowth of uh, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. Who had been who had come from the more uh, psychology psychiatry side of things, um, trying to make sort of a, a mathematical model of the brain, and they had made in the in the 1940s um, this kind of uh, this early neural net McCulloch Pitts network early neural net model, and that was sort of growing up into these things that were uh, being thought of in, in well really the connection between Turing machines and neural nets. These were sort of for a while. Those were sort of the two running most common sort of ways of thinking about models of computation were, were, were neural nets and Turing machines. And then somewhere in the middle of that, finite automata came in. Lambda calculus uh, was sort of a more theoretical and recursive functions were sort of a more theoretical, more mathematical side of things um, than, than those two. Okay, so into the middle of all that, von Neumann was interested in brains and computers and so on. And then also got interested in the theory of biology and the question of, could you, could you, could you mathematicize biology? I mean, in a sense, von Neumann's uh, sort of life activity had been mathematicizing things, whether it's mathematicizing quantum mechanics. Uh, he did things in metallurgy. He did things in a bunch of different areas, kind of, uh, you know, he was sort of a, a, a mathematician, a person who would come and, and mathematicize different areas. Um, so biology was one of his targets. And the question was, how would you make a mathematical model of a biological system? And his original idea was to have some kind of thing where a, a biological system was kind of like a factory. It has all of these, it makes all these different chemicals, it does all these different things. And he was imagining something that was, uh, I mean, von Neumann, um, I guess in the, in, the, in the distant past had been trained as a chemical engineer. I think that was the, the, the first part of his, his uh, educational path. And so his kind of first sort of instinct about biology was it's a giant sort of self-running chemical engineering factory. And I think then, if I remember the history correctly, Oscar Morgenstern, who was uh, later John von Neumann's big collaborator in theory of games, his work on game theory and uh, uh, for economics and international relations and so on, and I think Oscar Morgenstern's kids had a Meccano set, kind of a Lego set of its slightly earlier time. Um, and uh, uh, kind of looking at that, von Neumann kind of got the idea, well, maybe instead of using the kind of differential equations that would describe this giant chemical factory, maybe you could think about it more as biology as being more like a Meccano-like thing with uh, kind of um, uh, built from these slightly more discrete components. Meanwhile, Stan Ulam, had been, Stan Ulam had been kind of a, a discrete math enthusiast. He had uh, uh, grown up in Lviv, what was then in Poland, uh, then spelt, I, I can't say these words properly, it was then spelt L-W-O-W, -W, it's now spelt L-V-I-V, -V, and it's, it's now in Ukraine, um, but it was then in Poland. Um, and uh, uh, that's a place where for, Oh, who knows what reason, there was sort of a collection of mathematicians and particularly discrete mathematicians. There ended up being this thing, I wonder if it still exists, called the Scottish Cafe, which was um, uh, some kind of cafe where 
in in Lviv where where they would um, uh, people would write down these math problems and they had sort of a book that would hang out in the cafe where math problems would get written down and somebody else would would look at them and maybe I don't know whether they wrote the solutions years later or not. Um, but in any case, that was uh, sort of um, uh, Stan, Stan Ulam's origin had been um, in uh, uh, in that sort of environment. And um, he, uh, 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 and one of the things he'd worked on was infinite matrices. So, you know, two dimensional arrays, numbers, but infinite in size. And so he suggested to John von Neumann that that would be a good sort of additional idealization beyond kind of the idealization of, um, of the Meccano set type thing. And so von Neumann started looking at, at kind of then these two dimensional grids and sort of discrete states in the two dimensional grids. Von Neumann then uh, kind of had the idea, well, how would you then make a model of a biological cell, for example, within that framework? And he thought, well, biological cells are complicated. And he made this very elaborate kind of engineering model of a thing with, I don't know, um, 29 states. And I don't remember how, how, how many things. And, and they ended up being this 26,000 cell configuration, which by extending arms and copying this and doing that and doing the other could reproduce itself. Okay. And um, so, and that was a, a construction that von Neumann made uh, very late in his life. He died in what, 1957, I guess. Um, uh, and uh, he, um, uh, he had done that. So he was, he was kind of constructing something. He thought self-reproduction was kind of a key feature of biology. I guess by the time he finished that, uh, sort of the function of DNA had been discovered, but I, don't, I think he may have been uh, too sick by that time to have been sort of actively engaged in, 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 that type of, um, uh, in that type of work, because I don't think he knew about kind of uh, digital information and DNA at the time when he was thinking about sort of what would be the, the, the computational architecture and effect of biology. But um, I mean, Marvin Minsky told me, uh, okay, so, so one of the things obviously I discovered years later is that you don't need a complicated cellular automaton to end up getting you know, very complicated behavior that had also been seen and, and other things like game of life and so on had seen some, some aspects of that as well, but it became really clear from the stuff that I was doing in the early 1980s. And so then I was curious, what did people like von Neumann think about the question of why they needed such an unbelievably complicated system to achieve something like biology? And um, so Marvin Minsky, AI pioneer at, at MIT, um, had, had known uh, John von Neumann. Marvin was a, a graduate student in mathematics, actually, at, um, at Princeton, uh, where, where von Neumann was, although Marvin at the time had written a thesis about neural nets, as it turns out. Um, but uh, so I asked Marvin if he'd ever asked John von Neumann about this question of, of you know, was it, uh, you know, did you need complexity to make complexity, so to speak? And uh, Marvin claimed that he'd sort of asked such similar questions and that sort of von Neumann had just been kind of like, well, of course you, you kind of need that type thing. You know, how could you get this such a complicated thing out? I don't know, Marvin wasn't not always the most accurate uh, purveyor of historical stories. Um, but that was, uh, that's a data point at least. But anyway, then, um, so von Neumann constructed this immensely complicated self-reproducing automaton. He then, there was a person called Arthur Burks, who had been one of von Neumann's assistants at the Institute for Advanced Study, along with a person called Julian Bigelow and maybe a couple of other people um, who uh, uh, were working on the early computer project and so on. Herman Goldstein was another one. Uh, Herman Goldstein went to IBM. Uh, Julian Bigelow stayed at the Institute and actually was still there when, when I was at the Institute in the early 80s. Um, and uh, Arthur Burks, uh, somewhat amusingly, and I did talk to him about this, um, sort of said, ah, this computer stuff, it's going to blow over. I want to do something long term. I'm going to go into philosophy. And he became a philosophy professor at University of Michigan, um, although he was also responsible for uh, some things like I think he he was probably responsible for bringing John Holland, sort of pioneer of genetic programming and things to the University of Michigan. And um, there was sort of a, a whole, whole chain of, of, of related people there. But, but Arthur Burks kind of went more into philosophy than into the practicalities of computing. But one of the things he did was to finish von Neumann's book on the theory of self-reproducing automata, 
he also made another contribution to the whole uh, business by naming cellular automata, cellular automata. Um, but von Neumann, so that was kind of what, what von Neumann um, uh, did in this area, constructed this immensely complicated kind of engineering construction um, and, and Arthur Burks finished that book. And that was by then, I don't know, probably got finished in the early 60s, I would guess. Meanwhile, Stan Ulam had been mostly at Los Alamos. I think he was at University of Southern California for a little while, maybe University of Colorado, if I'm remembering correctly, for a while too, but had been at Los Alamos a bunch. One feature of being at Los Alamos was that there were electronic computers there. Um, I think there was a machine called the Maniac there, if I remember correctly. In any case, there were machines, even in the 1950s, there were uh, you know, digital computers available at Los Alamos, um, and they were being used uh, clearly in the, um, uh, the, the, the early use of, well, at first human computers and then electronic computers. Human computers together with you know, mechanical computing devices had been for calculating features of, of the early um, uh, nuclear weapon systems and so on. And that kind of continued uh, to be an important thing to do, to calculate, to do these calculations. Um, you know, the famous, one famous calculation that had to be done, which was long before the era of electronic computers, in the first um, uh, nuclear explosion test in 1945, um, the, uh, you know, the question was, would detonating a nuclear weapon in or having a nuclear explosion in the Earth's atmosphere ignite the atmosphere and cause all of the, uh, you know, start a kind of chain reaction that would do something like, you know, uh, make everything turn into nitrous oxide or something like that. And that was uh, a, a, a late stage calculation that somebody did that no, that probably wouldn't happen. And uh, so, so they decided to go ahead and do the test, uh, do the test on the basis of that not happening. But in any case, computing had been an important thing um, at Los Alamos. And uh, one feature of the computers there was that sort of computers were in sufficiently plentiful supply that you could use them to do kind of random experiments on. And so um, uh, Stan Ulam together with um, Schrant, Richard Schrant maybe, um, uh, did a few experiments on cellular automaton-like things. Um, this is probably in the 50s, in the 1950s, um, and um, uh, ended up looking at some slightly generalized, um, uh, somewhat zero one two dimensional cellular automata and making patterns from them. Also actually tried to make a three dimensional cellular automaton pattern and had a, had a structure constructed out of wooden blocks that they photographed and things. Those papers, I don't think ever got so sort of published in journals, I think they were internal reports at Los Alamos. Um, I certainly saw them years later. Um, I think Stan Ulam and some of those other guys were talking about a potential field called auxology, which was some kind of thing to do with the study of growth and the study of how things should, I don't know, what does auxology, it must come from a Greek, and I, Greek word, and I'm not um, remembering what that, that well, it, might, oh, it must be the same word, same word root as the, as the root for auxin, which is a plant hormone. So I don't know exactly what that must be, some kind of extension and growth type word in Greek. But anyway, that was a thing that, that, that they were interested in at that time. And they did a little bit of work on that. That was around the same time that the Fermi Pasta Ulam experiment got done. That was also done at Los Alamos, mid 1950s. And that was a, 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 an experiment where the question was, I think a question asked by Enrico Fermi um, was if you have a bunch of springs and weights attached to them, you have a whole chain of these things, just start them going. If they are harmonic oscillators, if they are linear springs, then we kind of know what happens and we can use Fourier analysis to say there are certain modes of the thing and it all behaves in a simple way. The question was, if you're trying to understand thermodynamic equilibrium and you're trying to understand how does one go from something that has some, uh, the, um, 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 uh, how does one, um, how does one go from, from something where there are just uh, uh, sort of individual modes excited in this collection of springs to something where energy has been spread among many modes. 
And so the idea was, well, let's add some nonlinearity to these springs. And when you do that, you can no longer do the kind of Fourier analysis calculation. And so what those guys realized is, well, you could actually compute it on a computer. And so they did. And um, they noticed that there was a spreading of energy between the different modes, but there were these weird things where there was sort of, it took a lot longer to spread the energy than one might've thought. And that was one of the uh, several discoveries of the phenomenon of solitons, solitary waves um, was made there. But that was another kind of piece of the kind of tradition of doing sort of exploratory uh, computational work at Los Alamos at that time. I should say that there was a little bit of exploratory work that got done even on the, on the Institute for Advanced Study computer um, for example, people have been interested in computing the digits of the square root of two to see whether there will be regularities in them, things like that. Um, but in any case, the, the um, uh, Ulam, uh, you know, he worked on this in the 1950s, I guess, on these early cellular automata. And then to my knowledge, he did nothing more on them. Um, and then I met him in probably 19, well, I, we had a conference at Los Alamos. I was a consultant at Los Alamos um, in their theoretical division, uh, starting probably in 81, something like that, 82. And um, as a result of that, uh, organized this conference. After I started working on cellular automata, I thought it'd be cool to organize a conference about it. And, and somehow that got done at Los Alamos um, and along with a couple of other people and some help from the Los Alamos kind of um, uh, yeah, theory, theory division uh, uh, sort of management, uh, we organized this conference. It was kind of a fun conference because cellular automata was something that had been worked on in various disparate places and um, uh, uh, by many different names. They were called uh, tessellation automata, homogeneous structures. Um, what's the name in, in um, oh my. Uh, there was a name, um, automorphisms of the shift is one, but not automorphisms, um, uh, I forget. There, there are a bunch of other names um, from very different origins. Forests of stunted trees was another cellular automaton thing, but I had tracked all this stuff down um, because I was trying to understand the history of, of the field. I mean, one of the things that had happened was essentially everything that had been done had been done on two-dimensional uh, grids. And, and in many cases, the, the rules had gotten a bit more ornate. And, and von Neu um, um, Stan Ulam actually had thought about the one-dimensional case and had convinced himself that it couldn't be interesting and that the only way to make it interesting was to have some complicated long-range rule type thing. So, uh, you know, he, he didn't do those experiments. Again, the experiments that I ended up doing in the early 80s would have been actually very easy to do on the computers at Los Alamos in the 1950s, but, but they weren't done. Um, so in any case, the, uh, uh, this conference in 1983 was kind of fun because I invited kind of uh, all the people who'd ever written a, about these things that were equivalent to cellular automata. And it's just an interesting collection of people um, that, uh, um, that ended up coming. And there's a proceedings from that back from 1983. But the after dinner speaker um, for that conference that we organized was, was Stan Ulam talking about kind of the, the history of, uh, uh, of things like this at Los Alamos. And I have to admit that I don't really remember, I think it was not a terribly good speech as far as I was concerned, but it, I don't actually remember uh, specific content from it. A, a friend of mine uh, interviewed Stan Ulam, a science journalist interviewed Stan Ulam and the, and the transcript of that interview exists and maybe we should put it on the web at some point. It's kind of an interesting interview in which um, one of the more notable things is, you know, well, to you guys, you know, today, John von Neumann uh, is just one of these mathematicians of old, like, like Gauss is to Stan Ulam. But to Stan, John von Neumann is this jolly fellow who he knew pretty well. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, that, that um, um, now as far as some um, um, you know, I didn't know directly about Stan Lamb's work on the Manhattan Project, which was what this question originally was, was about. I mean, I'd certainly heard of the Teller Ulam device um, for, for thermonuclear uh, explosions, but I um, wasn't 
uh, didn't have specific knowledge of that. I mean, it was a it was a very notable thing back in the in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when I was involved in in particle physics and so on, that the kind of the 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 uh, the sort of the the shadow of the Manhattan Project was very much alive and well, and and there were many people who had had distinguished roles in the Manhattan Project, and who basically had been uh, sort of uh, uh, in a sense had whole careers that that had been launched by their involvement in the Manhattan Project, and it was uh, surely a very um, uh, a very impressive crowd um, that uh, uh, that figured out the things that had to be figured out from you know Dick Feynman who was who was in charge of the human computers um, uh, who were doing calculations because that was before the, the during the Manhattan Project was before electronic digital electronic computers existed um, to uh, uh, people like um, oh gosh there were there were always people some of them were still at Los Alamos when when in the early 80s like Nick Metropolis inventor of the Metropolis algorithm for for Monte Carlo calculations um, people uh, uh, just all sorts of different people. Um, and, and it was always something where, you know, in the days before the web, you couldn't go look up, oh, what did Bob Backer do in the Manhattan Project? What did so-and-so do in the Manhattan Project? But there were all these people who were sort of highly placed in the physics world who had been sort of gotten their start through being young people making contributions to the Manhattan Project. And, and a lot of that was sort of still had seeded the field of physics. Um, Let's see. Um, okay, there's a question here from Aaron. How do I approach studying the history of technology to inform work on current projects? Do you do very targeted studies when starting a project? How much historical context is enough? You know, this is something that comes up both in, in doing science and in doing other things. Um, I find it hard, okay. Usually a project starts with a question or some objective. And then the first question is, has it already been answered? Do people already know the answer to this? Do people already know how to do this? So there's a certain amount of investigation there, but often what you find is, well, it doesn't look like people directly address this question. There are things sort of around it that are sometimes quite incomprehensible. Um, because they require, you know, some whole context that I don't have um, to understand. And so then the question is, how deeply do you dive into that context and trying to understand all of it? And is it a good idea or not? And sometimes I think it's, it's kind of not such a good idea because that context took a field to a certain point and it didn't get it to the point where you want it to get to. And there's a reason for that. It got stuck for some reason. And part of the reason might have been that context had defined things in a certain way. And it kind of, you can't get there from here once you've defined things in that way. So if you dive deep into that context, you kind of cut yourself off from wherever, you know, whatever the way you have to go in this perhaps uh, uh, more, you know, different direction. So anyway, the, the, I, I think, you know, I tend to do homework after the fact more than perhaps homework before the fact. Once I think I understand a bit more about how something works, I then, I, I guess I'm both interested in history and I find, uh, I, 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 I sort of feel an obligation to understand the history. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, if you're an academic, it's kind of like, let's just throw in some references and then that's good, that, that's, that's what we need to do. Uh, I guess I have been actually interested in the actual history of things, which requires a lot more work than just, you know, throwing in, sprinkling in the references type thing. And, but I find it interesting. Uh, and, and sometimes understanding the history gives one an idea about some, some great new thing that one can do. I would say more often, it's just interesting, just intellectually interesting to see what happened intellectually interesting and relevant for the next project to see how did they miss that? Why didn't they do that? Well, can I learn something from the mistake that was made in missing some particular thing? 
Uh, and, and, you know, that sort of gradually builds up over the course of my life, I suppose. I've, I've just seen a huge number of examples of that, of, of you know, uh, of situations where people like, it was very close. And if they'd only conceptualized it this way, they would have been able to, to get further, so to speak. And I, I have to say, I, those kinds of uh, issues uh, certainly, I reflect on those issues as I'm trying to do projects, and it's kind of like, what would, uh, you know, uh, what would the thing that, where am I stuck here in the same way that Field X was stuck in 1945 or something or wherever it was, um, and can I see my way through based on knowing what happened in Field X? Um, more so, I would say, methodologically than in terms of specific content. And when it comes to uh, well, when it comes to uh, another thing worth saying is that that sometimes there are old ideas that uh, in the new context that one has or with the new tools one has, now those ideas can actually turn into something. Sometimes there are ideas, well, sometimes in, in um, uh, uh, some, some places, uh, like in particularly in, I don't know, models of computation, which sort of uh, somewhere between technology and, and, and science, uh, you know, you look at some of those things and it's like, oh my gosh, this is so complicated. Like von Neumann's self-reproducing automaton. Oh my gosh, this is so complicated. What can I learn from this, if anything? You know, or, or did they, uh, you know, is there a way to drill down underneath all of this complexity of models and find sort of an essential thing underneath? Or is it all just tied up with the complexity of this model and there's really not much underneath? And, and so, it, you know, I've, I've seen it go both ways. Um, Aaron is asking, is there a list of history of science and technology books that I would recommend? I don't know, I, I kind of like, there's a, there's a series, there's a couple of books on the history of the mathematical sciences that I rather like, nice summaries of things. I, I tend to, um, um, I suppose I'm, I'm, um, um, there are, you know, I, I have a huge number of historical scientific biography books and, um, uh, you know, you learn different things from different books. I mean, sometimes there'll be books written by the person themselves and autobiography. Sometimes, I don't know, I'm just remembering I, you know, one random book I have is, um, a book with the title Lord Kelvin's Early Home. And it's written by the sister of, uh, um, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, um, and it's kind of a charming book. I don't know how much it tells one about sort of the the uh, uh, the discovery of of I don't know features of of, um, of thermodynamics and temperature and so on. But it, it it is it paints a picture of a person, and sometimes or you know Darcy Thompson, uh, his daughter wrote a, a biography of him. There are these kinds of um, uh, and, and different, you know, just, just different, or, or, you know, Sarah Turing wrote a biography of, of her son, Alan Turing. Um, these are things that, uh, you know, you see these different books that have different angles. There may be a, a, a very, for example, um, uh, well, Ada Lovelace, for example, who I studied a bit, um, uh, had had a variety of biographers who'd written, in some cases, rather, rather, uh, strange biographies, which were very, you know, which had missed many points and, and concluded had many kind of axes to grind, I think, um, that, uh, uh, and then more recently, some rather, rather well-written things have been, have been written about Ada Lovelace. Um, but in a sense, there were, uh, each of these things, even if it's not a very good biography, um, somehow there are some things you can learn. I mean, you have to, you have to kind of, I think in some cases, uh, at least for me, there are cases where I kind of feel like I can tell the person really did a serious job of the history and they didn't make a lot of mistakes. And there are cases where people just sort of plucked a few threads from here and there and knitted them together into a giant sweater or something. And um, it, it isn't, uh, um, uh, and, and what comes out is, has little relationship to, um, to the reality of what went in and is, is kind of a, a more like a sort of piece of historical fiction than it is a, a piece of historical biography. You know, one of the things that I've noticed from my efforts to do historical biography, one of the things that I think people sometimes don't understand is in the end, if you, if you understand enough, everything makes sense. That is, uh, 
If you say, how did Ada Lovelace get to the point of doing this or that thing that she did? Or how did so-and-so, or how did Ramanujan get to the point where he did such and such a thing? These are things which, if you drill long enough, you will understand. At least, there are two things you need to do to be able to understand this. You need to know something about how discoveries are actually made and what it actually feels like and how people act around the process of making discoveries. And one of the things that's also true is that many discoveries that get made in, in science, technology, and so on, you know, the storybook version is, you know, on this particular day, an apple fell on somebody's head and they had this brilliant idea. Okay, that is never the real story. The real story is usually five years, 10 years of, you know, context building, of, of getting to the right place at the right time, so to speak. And then maybe the apple falls and, you know, that's, uh, that's the moment or, or people often... Uh, after the fact, the people themselves will kind of simplify the story by saying, you know, and, and then the apple fell and then everything got figured out. Uh, sometimes they don't even recognize that for 10 years they were working in that direction. And that was just the, you know, the sort of final moment where things clicked. But one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, when, when something, there are no surprising jumps, when you peel everything back, you find out that there was a big, long process that led from here to there. And yes, there was a particular idea, a particular day, but it wasn't the giant jump. It was the final thing that, you know, reached across to the other side of the river type thing. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, the, the bridge was already largely built. It was just the completion, so to speak. And, and I noticed that even with things I've done myself, I'm like, uh, you know, oh, it looks like that just got figured out. And, you know, I must have figured that out just one day. And I, I go back and look and I realize, well, actually, there's this whole long history that caused me to think about the right kinds of things in the right kind of way at that particular time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's never that simple. Um, but on the other hand, it always has an explanation. And people sometimes, I think, who, who, you know, write history from outside of the kind of the experience of doing science, for instance, have this idea that people have these flashes of inspiration and then everything is clear and it was not clear before. And that's just not how it works. And in all the efforts that I've done at writing historical biography, um, that's, you know, you can always trace the path. There always is a path. It's never a jump. And it, it's, uh, you know, it's a walking path, not a, a giant jump from here to there. And it's just, that's the nature of doing hard things is that they tend, you know, you have to build them up over, over a period of time. Uh, question from Spicy here. What was it about ancient Greece that allowed for great advances in math and science and great thinkers? I don't know that history as well as I might have done, uh, might do. I mean, I think that um, the, the concept, uh, I mean, in, in, you know, Athens was a place that, you know, I mean, its economy was largely based on, you know, slaves do the work and um, uh, then there are the Athenian citizens and they are um, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know whether they're, uh, you know, some, some of these people like, you know, I don't know, Plato and so on was, a, I think he owned vineyards and so on. I mean, these are people who were, who were kind of uh, sort of set up in the, um, uh, in the kind of, um, my impression at least, is that they were not people who were sort of um, uh, um, working in the salt mines, so to speak. They were people who were, who were uh, able to uh, lead a sort of uh, upscale of the time life. Now, I don't know, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about sort of the philosophers of old, whether it's the, you know, the Epicurus or the Democritus, or the, um, you know, those various pre-Socratic philosophers and so on, they came from all different places around kind of Asia Minor um, and, uh, you know, the sort of Greek um, connected world. They weren't all from Athens, um, but I, you know, that, that's obviously the, the, a big concentration was, it was in Athens. And I don't really know the, um, uh, the kind of, um, the, the, the sort of aspects of, of, of how that was, was working. I have the impression that, um, well, I mean, the interest in, in ancient Greece 
was this kind of philosophical interest of, of kind of the, uh, the uh, you know, thinking about things from a, an abstract point of view. In Babylonian times, and, and you know, that Babylon was sort of the place where a lot of kind of our modern ideas about, about math and, and kind of those kinds of things originated. And in a sense that was driven, I think, by a very practical thing, which was they had cities. And as soon as you have a city, you have to kind of like organize things. You have to know like, oh, somebody owns this plot of land. Somebody's going to inherit this thing from that person. People are going to sell each other things. And there's got to be standardized weights and measures. Oh, you've got to have, you know, a tax year. And it's got to be, you know, you've got to have calendars and all this kind of thing. All this structure was very much a thing that came in in Babylon. Now in Babylon, one has the impression, at least based on what survived, that it was very practical. It was like, you know, the math exercises, which are quite hard, even by today's standards of, you know, uh, X number of people are digging a trench and the trench will be this shape and they shovel this number of things of dirt. You know, how long will it take to make this, this weirdly shaped trench and so on? There are all sorts of problems one still has from ancient Babylon of that, of that type, word problems of, of ancient mathematicians. I mean, it, well, in, in those days, there were these scribal schools, right, that taught, I mean, the big thing to learn was, could you learn to write? make these cuneiform wedges um, on pieces of clay. And in the scribal schools, they would teach uh, sort of how to write, but that came bundled with learning math and uh, you know, learning about things you could write about. Um, and so in Babylon, my impression is that the, you know, it was not a very philosophical in, in kind of place. It was more a place where it was like, let's do the math and work out how long it's gonna take you know, to, to plant this field or to do what, whatever else one was going to do. Um, and I think uh, uh, in, you know, in, in Greek times, even in the times of uh, uh, people like Thales, Heraclitus, all these kinds of people, um, the kind of the idea of sort of how do things work? And let's try and ask the question, you know, how does the world actually work? Um, and that was a thing which I don't think you know, the Babylonian, I think in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I think there's some sort of how the world works type things, but they're pretty simple. I, I think that, that, you know, they're, they're sort of creation myths as every, as every civilization has had, but um, I don't think they're, they're particularly kind of um, uh, complex thinking kinds of things. And that's something that seems to have originated in, in, in Greek times. It's something that um, uh, was then, you know, that was the kind of focus and, you know, it, it kind of Aristotle was kind of the person who cataloged the most of that stuff and his works were the thing that things that for a thousand years or so were kind of the, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of other than the Bible, so to speak, were the kind of the, um, in the Western, in Western world were kind of the, the source of uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, this is the, this is the encyclopedia of knowledge, so to speak. Um, and I think that that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, um, in the Roman civilization, there's again, much less sort of philosophical science, so to speak, being done, much less thinking about how is the world fundamentally put together. I mean, one exception is Lucretius from first century AD, who was, I think, a Greek connected um, uh, person, although he wrote in Latin. Um, he wrote this book called, um, De rerum natura, the, on the nature of things, um, which uh, has one, one of my favorite um, uh, kind of uh, conceptions from antiquity about how the world works. You know, the world is made of atoms, he said, following Democritus and Lucippus and people like that. Um, the world is made of atoms and perhaps they are arranged together to make the world as words are arranged together in sentences according to the laws of grammar. And I, I think that's a nice, I mean, you know, it, it's written in, a, in, in poetry and it's, it's a very poetic version of a way to describe a formal system where you have these discrete elements and then you're, you're making something like a grammar that describes how those elements go together. Um, I'm not sure I have a, there's, there's probably more to say about, um, uh, you know, one question, um, a friend of mine named Armand Dango, who's a classics professor in Oxford, has written about... Uh, kind of the, the concept of innovation in ancient Greece. And um, I think one of the things he says is that for a, in a lot of areas, there wasn't a lot of motivation to do technological innovation 
because basically there were people to do the work. And I mean, I, I hate to draw the analogy with modern times of manufacturing of, uh, you know, while you can still find people to do the work, why make a robotic factory, so to speak? And the, the one place where there really was technological innovation was in things like siege machines. And I think Alexander the Great was, was big on that kind of stuff. Technology for warfare was a place where people uh, needed to innovate and uh, because you know you you, ha you had to build the bigger siege machine or whatever the bigger thing to I don't know scale the walls of some city or or try and uh, throw something over the walls or some some such other thing, um, but I think that that so there wasn't as much technological innovation in those days as might have been uh, you know wasn't was not as as driven by by those things as as it might have been. Um, Let's see. Uh, gosh. I think I've talked about, there's a question from RBS here about Ed Fredkin. I, I think I've talked about Ed before here. Um, so let me, I'm happy to talk about Ed and, and um, uh, uh, but I think I, I think I, and let me not repeat myself there. Um, Let's see. Okay, RJ is asking, in 2001, a space odyssey, the alien monolith is said to be a von Neumann probe. Is it rectangular because of the cellular automaton inspiration? So I think that conflates several pieces of science fiction history. I think that the concept, okay, for people who are, who are not, um, into this kind of history of fictional science. Uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey was made in 1968 by Stanley Kubrick. Um, it, it happened to be, for my personal history, it happened to be the first movie I ever saw in a movie theater. So it's, and I, I was, uh, I wrote something about it, um, oh, a couple of years ago at the 50th anniversary. And I was, uh, because I'm a archive nut, I had actually saved, I guess I saw it in, in some kind of, um, at a time in, in England when, when um, it was sort of a, a just come out movie and it was sort of the movie theater was celebrating the, it's just come out movie. Um, although I think it was a, a, you know, a matinee of the movie and I was sort of pretty much the only person in the movie theater, just some random, whatever, eight, nine year old kid or something. Those were the days when you could just plunk an eight, nine year old kid in a movie theater on their own. And, and that was uh, considered just fine. Um, but in any case, the, the, um, uh, you know, they, they had a sort of program for this thing, which I, which I had kept. And so I can precisely, uh, you know, reproduce the, the, you know, when I saw this movie, all that kind of thing. But anyway, the 2001 movie um, was based on a, a short story by Arthur C. Clarke. And I originally sort of was inspired by that. And then the, the, I think the screenplay was written by, by um, uh, I think Arthur C. Clarke was, was much involved in, in writing the thing. Um, and then there was um, uh, a book version of 2001. And if I'm not remembering wrong, I think the idea of uh, that it was, okay, what was, first of all, what was a von Neumann probe? Let me explain that. So this idea of self-reproducing automata had in, in the 1950s, when you were thinking about what's the really high tech thing that we could imagine doing with, uh, with um, was it, yeah, 1950s, right, with, with our devices, it's, oh, let's do something in space. Let's have a self-reproducing factory on the moon. And so this kind of the, the cellular automaton idea uh, of self-reproducing whatever is quickly segued into people writing about self-reproducing factories on the moon. And this notion of a von Neumann probe was kind of the idea of, well, let's send out self-reproducing spacecraft. You know, forget about having, and that's the way we populate the galaxy. And I thought it was in the 2010 sequel to 2001 that the idea was added of having these, um, of having just a giant collection of these, um, of these uh, black monoliths and so on that eventually, I don't know, uh, maybe spoiler alert, I think it turns, Jupiter into a star or some such other thing, I forget. Um, 
but uh, it wasn't a spoiler alert because I don't remember the plot well enough. But in any case, the, in, in the original 2001 movie, the, the thing is that uh, the concept is, this is sort of first contact with alien civilization and the aliens have left this, this object, which was critical to the history of, of uh, human development. They've left this object, they've left a, a version of this object on the moon. And the question is, it was, it was the, it called TMA-1, the Tycho Magnetic Anomaly. And it was the, the storyline, I think, was that they, you know, detected this strange magnetic uh, thing on the moon and uh, the moon doesn't have a magnetic field. I don't think that was known when that movie was made, whether the moon has a magnetic field or not. It doesn't. Um, but uh, this was sort of the concept was there was some magnetic thing buried uh, near this crater and... Um, the, the, but that thing was an artifact. And the question is, cinematograph cinematographically, how do you represent the fact that a thing on the moon is an artifact? Because most of the moon is made of jagged you know, rocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The concept was, it's a perfect, precise, cuboidal object. And that perfection is kind of what leads you to the concept that this must have been something, an artifact. It's kind of ironic that we are so proud of our engineering and so on, and we're so, you know, we make such, such sophisticated things, and yet the way to show that it's a thing that's made as a, by, by, by some purpose is to show that it's a, a, you know, a perfect geometrical form rather than something much more complicated looking like a rock. It's, it's kind of ironic that, that that's the signature of artifactness is that it's simpler than what nature makes. And that's, that's something that's interesting if one's understanding sort of the origins of complexity in, in the world. But um, uh, in that movie, it's kind of the, uh, you know, I think it has one to four to nine uh, side ratios. I never checked that it actually is that in the movie. You never know in, in uh, you know, what gets, get, what gets changed for, for cinematographic effect. But um, the thing that, um, uh, Let's see, I was, I was going to say in that movie, there's a kind of a curious thing in, in towards the end of the movie, um, the, uh, someone actually goes and kind of meets the aliens, so to speak, or something like that. And there's a few frames, it's sort of an interesting sequence where there are these kind of flashing lights. And you see, if, you, if you freeze the frames, you'll see that there are a bunch of octahedra, flashing octahedra, there are a bunch of geometrical forms. And that's kind of the, the uh, I think, Kubrick's sort of way of signaling, this is a, you know, this is a, an intentional artifact-like thing, is it's a geometrical form like that. Um, so I, I don't think there was a connection between uh, kind of the grids of cellular automata and the, um, and the, the cuboid shape of those, of those, um, of those things. I, I, I don't know. I, I did interact a bit with Arthur C. Clarke, um, and I'm trying to remember. I have this vague recollection that he wrote me a letter about something to do with cellular automata, um, and so that he was aware of those things. But this is much later. This is, this is now in the probably maybe 1980s, maybe, maybe much later than that even. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I can't connect those, those dots quite. Um, Someone is asking, what is the book top right of the horse's head? Do I have a, 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 a book? Hmm, I'm not sure. Hard to know. I think my, my, my books circulate around. I have about 8,000 books altogether. I just did a reorganization of books recently, and the ones here are some that I'm reading currently and uh, or supposed to be reading currently. And then there's a bunch of books that sort of back that way that are about, um, uh, um, uh, let's see, closest to the camera. Oh, oh, that, that book, it's called The Conlanger's Lexipedia. Um, as it turns out, it's not a book I've, I have to say that I've read. Um, that's a collection of books um, uh, to do with a project that I'm hoping to get started soon about what I call a symbolic discourse language. Um, the, um, uh, 
that project has to do with finding a way to represent, just as with Wolfram language, we've, we've created a computational language which can express many kinds of things about the world. The idea of this sort of symbolic discourse language is to be able to express other kinds of things about the world, including things about people and mental states and you know, intentions and all sorts of other kinds of things. And the kinds of things that you might see in a piece of English text or in a legal document, which are not yet representable in our computational language. And so I've been interested in, in kind of making a language in which I can express things like, I want to eat a piece of chocolate. And um, that um, uh, uh, we can, in you know, our language right now, we can express the piece of chocolate part pretty well but the I want to eat part we can't yet express. So I've been interested in, in, in finding a way to express those things. And there's kind of been a, a funny history in this sort of notion of finding sort of a symbolic language to represent thought. It's something that uh, was quite popular in the 1600s. Um, and uh, it's kind of an unfinished project from the 1600s. Um, you know, uh, Leibniz was... Um, uh, um, was, was part of that. Uh, he had his Characteristica Universalis, his idea that you could convert everything like all features of a legal case into some kind of thing like logic and then be able to immediately decide the case. There were people like a person called John Wilkins, an English chap who um, uh, had a book, I'm sure I have a copy of it there. Yes, an essay towards a real character and a philosophical language. That was his book. Um, and uh, it, the goal was to have a representation of thing, exactly what I'm trying to do, you know, a representation of things in the world as a symbolic language. Now, now, you know, they had somewhat confused things like how the characters get written with how the grammar works, with how the actual meaning works and so on. But in Wilkins's book, for instance, there's sort of catalogs of the different kinds of things that exist in the world, a little bit like a thesaurus might have a catalog of concepts. It has a catalog of things that, that exist in the world. And um, the, uh, um, it, it's, um, uh, the thing that is, to me, interesting about it is you look at that catalog of things that exist in the world and you say, which of these are the same today as they were then? A lot was. The only thing is uh, there's an awful lot about the many ways to die um, and all sorts of terrible medical conditions which, which uh, are not common anymore that were you know, well covered in the things to know about life. Um, and obviously the, the, a big missing area is technology. Um, but a lot of the stuff in the middle about um, uh, you know, the way people lead their lives, it's the same in the 1600s as today. Um, but so this idea of sort of making it what was at those days mostly called a philosophical language, a language that could express things without using in, in a kind of precise fashion, without using the specific words of a human language, that was a thing that was also kind of related to the development of mathematical notation, things like that. Leibniz was much involved in that. Also, this idea of making kind of an artificial language that would be kind of a, a better representation. I mean, I think in in, in the hands of Leibniz, the, the Characteristica Universalis was sort of a, a, a connected to logic and connected to mathematics. Um, although I would say Leibniz doesn't make as much connection between logic and mathematics as he might have done. Those were to him, for him, you know, mathematics was more about algebra and so on, and, and logic was more about uh, kind of the, the reasoning of things. And um, uh, Wilkins, I don't think, was very mathematical in what he did. Um, so, the idea of kind of um, a, a language to represent things that kind of hung around for a long time. I mean, when George Boole was, was working on Boolean algebra, taking kind of logic and making it, mathematicizing it in the 1830s and so on, um, he, uh, his later book was called Laws of Thought. You know, he was imagining that sort of the Boolean algebra thing was kind of the, the basis for some sort of laws of thought. But, but the thing that really happened was, um, well, okay, so, so one of the things that happened in Leibniz's time is that Latin had been the language of scholarship for you know, 2000, close to 2000 years at that point. Um, and uh, no, not quite as long as that, 1500 years. Um, and, uh, but at that time, people were starting to write in the local languages, 
French, English, German. Um, you know, Newton wrote his Principia Mathematica in Latin. He wrote his optics in English uh, only a few years later, so to speak. So it, um, uh, one of the things that Leibniz was concerned with was, is, okay, is the scientific enterprise, the intellectual enterprise gonna fragment because nobody will be able to read each other's stuff anymore because it's not all in Latin. And that was part of his motivation for developing mathematical notation as kind of an international notation that would go across human languages. But that idea of how do you sort of make a, um, a kind of a, a non-language, a, a non-specific language language, uh, it hung around. I think the next time it really emerged was in the late 1800s. Uh, there was some mathematical work done on it. Um, Giuseppe Piano of the Piano Axioms of Arithmetic fame had a language he called Interlingua, which was a kind of um, uh, a Latin-based language that was intended to be um, uh, sort of a, a, a way of communicating things beyond mathematics in sort of precise, in some kind of uh, non, non-human language specific way. I mean, I'm afraid in the end, it's sort of a cautionary tale because Piano wrote some of his books in Interlingua and that sort of definitely reduced his, his, uh, his readership by having it not only on a subject that people found hard to understand, but also in a language that people didn't know. But around that time, um, uh, there were other artificial languages, the most well-known being Esperanto, developed by Zamenhof, I guess, in the 1880s. Um, and uh, that language, so Esperanto is a language which intended to have simplified, sort of normalized grammar and syntax and so on. It's a kind of a based on some mixture of, you know, Spanish and Polish and, you know, uh, Italian and, and maybe English and French and so on, that, that sort of general class of languages. Um, all mushed together to make something which has had a sort of simplified form. I think the word Esperanto means I hope in, in Esperanto. And, and Esperanto was seen as being something which would, among other things, sort of help bring peace to the world by having people be able to sort of speak a common language. And I think there was a, a sort of a complicated interplay between kind of world peace type movements and uh, just we're trying to make an international language type, type things. And Esperanto achieved a certain degree of success over the period from, I guess, 1880s up until probably, well, probably 100 years, basically. I remember it used to be the case if you went to like London Heathrow Airport that you would see, you know, signs for things in different languages. And my favorite was always the signs in Esperanto. But sometime in the 1980s, I think, they took down those signs. And, um, but in any case, the, 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 um, this idea of artificial human languages is, an interesting one sort of relates to the philosophical languages idea. In more recent times, there, there are a number of these um, uh, constructed languages, conlangs. Um, some of those have been constructed for sort of entertainment purposes, you know, Klingon, for example, or um, there's a language in the, what is it called? I'm afraid of, this, this shows one of my, one of my blind spots in, in, in culture. I never watch television, so I don't, I don't know this well, but there's a language in Game of Thrones um, that, uh, oh, something is krill, I don't remember what it's called. But anyway, that, that's another uh, known constructed language. And um, uh, so there's kind of, a, there's kind of a, a, a strange community of people who do language construction. Uh, there's a certain irony, I suppose. I haven't, I've always wanted to go to one of these conlangers conventions, but there's a certain irony because you bring together a bunch of people who've all invented their own language. And the question is, can they actually talk to each other? Because their own languages are all different. It reminds me of a thing I've, I've thought for ages about, you know, I've, I've made a point of trying to meet people who've, who've invented uh, uh, computer languages of various kinds. And I've, I've thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to bring everybody together? And I realized, no, you know, you know what? Everybody's just gonna be talking in their own language, basically. Um, not as much fun as you might think. But in any case, I think, um, uh, so this kind of conlang idea, uh, and there are a variety of kinds of, of uh, constructed languages from ones which are essentially, you know, artworks to ones which are intended to be uh, practical for some reason or another. They're kind of two extreme cases that um, uh, the, um, um, that I think are, are interesting endpoints. Um, uh, one is a language called Ithquil, uh, constructed by John Chiada. And another is a language called Tokipona, constructed by Sonia Lang. Uh, 
And Ithquil is the, the language that has everything in it. It's got, you know, I think um, its creator has sort of gone through the languages of, of that humans speak and tried to find all the different tenses that get used, all the different cases that get used and put them all into Ithquil. Um, and Tokipona, on the other hand, is a sort of minimal language that has only a few hundred words. And uh, I, I'm sort of curious to, to, um, uh, to communicate in, in, um, uh, in either of these. I mean, I, I think I, I had the opportunity to meet John Kiada and I was asking him, you know, can he speak fluent Ithquil? Well, not really. Um, and uh, uh, there've been few people who've learned it. Um, there's a, a strange story about a group in, I think, Ukraine that had, um, or maybe Russia, Ukraine, that area, um, that had, uh, um, I think this is a, a story that's been, been, been told out in the world, um, a group that had kind of decided that they would take seriously the, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis about human languages that, you know, the language you speak affects how you think about things. That hypothesis is, uh, you know, still a bit controversial for human languages, in my world, it's definitively true for computational languages that the, the language you use affects how you think about things. But in the human language case, the, you could imagine if you use Ithquil, which has all of the kind of linguistic uh, you know, wisdom of the world uh, plugged into it, that if you could only speak in Ithquil, you could think better. And so this group apparently uh, had decided to do that. Unfortunately, they had some other, in a rather Pythagorean way, they had some rather unsavory other beliefs about the world, and they were somehow wanted by some authorities somewhere and something, and it was all, all a bit weird. But um, that was at least a group, a, a rather Pythagorean style group, perhaps, that was learning Ithquil to, to better themselves, so to speak. But I, have, I, I haven't yet, I, I really should, should go to one of these um, events and, and maybe I'm, I'm not a good learner of languages myself. I, I, I maybe I, you know, I know that um, uh, at a time I, I learned kind of sort of all of the computer languages that existed at a certain time, not so much recently. Um, and uh, I didn't, I found that pretty easy, but when it comes to learning human languages, I've, I've not been very good at that. Although I know that there are studies that, that suggest that learning computer languages is uh, sort of aptitude at that is somehow correlated to learning human languages, which I find interesting if a little bit surprising. Um, but in any case, I'm, I'm not sure that, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how well I'd be able to learn some of these languages. Well, I should probably wrap up in a moment here, but um, uh, I can just try and, um, uh, oh, so many interesting questions. All right, I'm just, there's one, Mark C is commenting, what do I think is the significance of the Antikythera device, um, that sort of thing made of cogs, that's sort of an early astronomical computing thing. I don't know what to think about that. I don't know, I have to believe there were lots of those. I've, I've always wanted, you know, one day somebody's gonna find the Antikythera factory and they're gonna find all the different devices. And, you know, I have this kind of romantic view that perhaps Archimedes was somehow involved with that. And it, perhaps that's just because, you know, the business I've been in, in some ways is making tools for things like mathematics and um, uh, be kind of fun if I was in the same business that Archimedes used to be in. Um, but uh, the, you know, it's known that the Antikythera device had connections to Syracuse and the island of Sicily, which is where Archimedes lived. So there's a possibility that he was involved in some way. But yes, I, I have to believe, I mean, the, the Antikythera device was, was mentioned in, in, in writings by Cicero. So it was sort of a, a somewhat known or, or thing like that was mentioned by Cicero. So it's probably was, they, those were things. Now, why they didn't develop further, I'm not sure. Just as as mechanical calculators, as developed by Chicard and Pascal and these kinds of people didn't develop in the mid 1600s, probably because they didn't work that well and who could be bothered. And you know, most people knew how to add, add and multiply themselves by hand and you know, easier to do that than to you know, get this brass thing and try and run wheels around and so on. So I, I don't know. Um, the, uh, um, Oh, Dan is asking, have I read Asimov's Foundation Trilogy? And I have to say, no, I was a poor reader. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I, I read, tried to read some science fiction and I, 
I, I will admit that that was one where I, I it's kind of a mission of a personal um, uh, blind spot or something. Uh, you know, I read the beginning of it. I just, I couldn't, I, I found it really boring. And I just looked at the last few pages of, oh, well, what happened in the end type thing, which is just the most terrible way to read a fiction book. And um, no, so I just haven't had the opportunity to, to, um, uh, uh, to read that. And I don't, don't really know its, its story. Um, uh, okay, that's right. I'm, I'm being told Dothraki is the language of the, of the Game of Thrones. Yes, I, that, that, that's some, um, that's right. Uh, well, okay, I think we've, we've got some other interesting questions here. Oh, there's a question from Sean here, just following on to something I was talking about before, um, uh, about, I was saying that the, the solid automaton experiments that I did in the 80s could have been done at Los Alamos, why weren't they? Same reason as these things I'm saying about there are never jumps, it's always walks in the history of science. That is the, you know, you need to build up a conceptual framework where there's a reason to do such experiments. If you have a conceptual framework that just says, you know, why would we care about this? You're not gonna do it. And I think at the time, the concept of, of sort of models where computation is at the center of the idea of making the model just didn't really exist. Although, I don't know, I mean, I suppose they were getting closer to it. Um, uh, the idea, I'm sure, I bet I asked Stan Ulam this question, and sadly, I, I, uh, I certainly don't remember offhand the answer, you know, why? Well, as I said, he did try thinking about one-dimensional cellular automata, and he convinced himself that you had to do some very complicated thing with long-range rules and complicated number theory kinds of things. And I don't know why. I don't know why. I, you know, he just didn't happen to do the, the right experiments, I suppose. But I think the main reason was that the conceptual framework didn't exist that would lead you to think that that might be an interesting thing to do. All right, we should wrap up there. Um, so... Thanks for, for joining me and um, look forward to doing this.